Welcome to today's NDEP webinar, Food Insecurity and Its Impact on Diabetes Management, Identifying Interventions That Make a Difference. My name is Michelle owens Gary, and I'm a behavioral scientist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Division of Diabetes Translation in Atlanta. Today I'm honored to, pre to present a fantastic panel of experts. Our first presenter is Dr. Victoria Mayer, who is a, an assistant professor in the Department of Population Health Science and Policy and in the Department of Medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Mayer will be followed by Dr. Monadipa Becerra. Dr. Becerra is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Science and Human Ecology and coordinator of the Master of Public Health program at California State University, San Bernardino. And our third and final presenter is Dr. Gary Ferguson, who recently joined the Rural Alaska Community Action Program as its Chief Executive Officer. I'm going to start by sharing some common definitions of food security, food insecurity, and hunger. The United States Department of Agriculture defines food security as access at all times to enough food for an active and healthy life. Food insecurity, on the other hand, is the household level economic and social condition of limited ability to acquire adequate food. Another commonly used definition of food insecurity is whenever the availability of nutritionally adequate and safe foods or the ability to acquire acceptable food in socially acceptable ways is limited or uncertain. Food insecurity is different from hunger. Hunger may result from food insecurity, but it is an individual level physiological condition, which may be defined as the sensation caused by involuntary lack of food. These items or these quotations are from the ADA standards of medical care for diabetes from 2017 in the section tailoring treatment to reduce disparities. The ADA states that providers should assess social context, including potential food insecurity, housing stability and financial barriers, and apply that information to treatment decisions. Patients should be referred to local community resources when available. Providers should recognize that food insecurity complicates diabetes management and seek local resources that can help patients and the parents of patients with diabetes to more regularly obtain nutritious food, and that providers should consider risks of hypoglycemia in medication decisions. So a study was done recently looking at a systematic review. So this is when they take all the studies published in North America and try to find a cumulative summary of what the studies have shown. And they notice the higher the rate of food insecurity, the higher the rate of diabetes. So diabetes rate among those who were food insecure in the United States was 10.2%. But when you compare it to those who were food secure, it was 7.4%. And it's not just those who were food insecure. The researchers then broke that down into different levels of food insecure. So mild food insecurity or severe food insecurity. When looking at the diabetes rate among mild food insecurity, it was 10%. When you look at diabetes rate among severe food insecurity, it went up to 16.1%. So again, a much larger percent of those who were food insecure, severely food insecure, had type 2 diabetes rate. There were several other studies, and I will only mention a few of them, have shown similar trends. In a longitudinal study, again, this is when the population is followed over time, they've shown that if a population is food insecure, they're 50% more likely to have type 2 diabetes. The patients who are food insecure are also uh, have a higher rate of type 2 diabetes, even after accounting for everything else. For example, lifestyle factors, so smoking, drinking, physical activity, income level, employment, even after accounting for all of that, if you're food insecure, two to three times more likely to have type 2 diabetes. And similar trend was also shown with food insecurity and gestational diabetes. And we know gestational diabetes could potentially lead to type 2 diabetes in the long term. One of the major things that we also noticed is looking at the healthcare burden of food insecure individuals. This is not just about what happens to their health outcomes, but also are they spending more money because of worse health outcomes? 
National Health Interview Survey, which is a large-scale national study. It is not limited by the issue we have with small data is where we cannot generalize to the population. Because they use census information to make these data weighted to represent the entire United States, we can draw larger conclusions for the U.S. population. And one of the studies, they showed a dose-dependent relationship, which means the higher the food insecurity level, the less diabetics were to use medication. And this was even higher among racial ethnic minorities, as well as those who had more than one chronic disease. A similar study using the same database also found that one in six patients who were diabetes were also food insecure. And if they were food insecure, they were less likely to use medication, they were reducing their medication, they were delaying it or avoiding it because it's financially hard to afford medication. A smaller study, however, found that diabetic patients who were going to food banks, kitchens, or soup kitchens were actually one-third of them were paying for medication versus food. This slide really talks about in California Health Interview Survey, which is the largest state health survey, looking at the emergency department utilization among diabetics. And diabetics who were food secure, they reported a rate of ED utilization at about 7%. But food insecure diabetics actually visited the emergency department a lot higher, nearly at 13%, showing a much higher rate of healthcare utilization. This high rate of healthcare utilization means higher copay, higher medical bill, which means we're going back to the same situation where patients are having to choose between food versus healthcare, what they need to maintain their health services. And a previous researcher already mentioned SNAP. And the research does, in fact, show that SNAP reduces the burden of food insecurity. However, this is not true for all populations. A study in California, which has one of the largest Hispanic populations, showed that Hispanics, even when eligible, are less likely to participate in SNAP. And that is often because of lack of knowledge, stigma, the healthcare cost, which limits the ability to want to apply to SNAP, as well as transportation. And this is where Promotora model, or Promotora is, which are community health workers, can come in very handy. It has been shown to be useful in small scale at Mexico-Texas border, as well in small parts of California, where community-based resources that are promoted by community health workers or promotors can reach that population that's stigmatized by participating in SNAP. This has also shown some potential with the veteran population, but hasn't been pilot tested at a large scale, where community health workers can reach the veteran population and marginalized population to make sure they're registering for SNAP or even if they're reducing the stigma and addressing transportation. So shifts in diet, when you look at um, a changing diet from a more traditional diet to a more Western diet, you see uh, trends. And we know that stress, and that was a, a big component, I just want to highlight that, that it isn't just always about the food, it's also about the stress. And we, in the Native community, there's a, a big push to understand and help alleviate the trauma uh, that's connected with historical trauma and helping people to address intergenerational trauma, which is connected also to chronic disease, including diabetes. And I like to talk about uh, decolonizing healthcare, where we look at food and food as medicine. It's a really important concept for our traditional peoples, and it's such a rich way that we're uh, decolonizing our healthcare and our food systems. And there's a lot that has been highlighted already, and I just want to draw our attention to CDC's work that has already been highlighted around uh, traditional foods across America and in our Native communities. There's some amazing resources that have been highlighting some of these best practices in local food systems and traditional foods. And one of them, uh, the store outside your door, which I've been a part of uh, since 2006, which is, uh, this is our YouTube channel, where you can um, watch a very short video on how to hunt fish, gather, and grow your own food. And we connect it to culture and language and elders and youth. Uh, there's a lot of components that we look at sharing this knowledge with our next generation and preserving this knowledge. And, since then, some of the elders we've worked with have already passed, so we're feeling very blessed to have captured the wisdom that they share with us. And also a part of the CDC Native Diabetes Wellness Program, there's many programs across the nation that have been highlighted that you can go online and learn more about these programs, too, in Alaska.